out and in, mask already on. And I, I, I'm telling you, I've been really impressed with how how it's went. Just a quick note from your host, this meeting is being recorded and we are live now on YouTube. Uh, Bruce, are we helping Councilwoman Moore connect via the Samsung account possibly? Is there anything I need to do to help? Uh, yes, uh, Amanda and I are on the phone with her. Amanda, is she still on the phone? Yeah. I don't think so. I didn't hear anything, but his air conditioner was on. Try it again. Nope, he can't hear you. Um, um, can Shelly hear us? No, she can't hear you. No, she, she can't hear us either. Um, just ask that she start her video, which could create a little pop-up on her device, which might help. And she may or may not know this already, but I, I believe on most mobile devices, if you gently tap the screen, the audio and video controls are on the bottom left. It does say she's connecting to audio now. Nicola, can you check and see if she's unmuted on the host side? It still indicates she's connecting, so it doesn't indicate whether she's muted or not at this point. Hello. Oh, good. Grace. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you guys, I need you some. Uh, I need for you all to buy me some B complex. Okay. <laughs> okay, bye bye. <laughs> we'll send some B complex over. Thank you very much. <laughs> Woo, I had to do this by myself. This is education. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Is this all that's going to be there? Well, yeah. all the council is here um, yeah. and uh, quite a few staff. I don't see any others, uh, although it is open, so others can uh, hear me? Can join. Yeah. Yeah. 
a lot of familiar faces on my computer screen, that's for sure. I, I should have been I should have been doing Zoom on my computer and not my iPad for for this is a whole new experience. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Ooh, the best I I I'm gonna want to give out an award first. The best background is a toss up between Scott Myers and Stacy Kinders. Oh. Woo I'm digging, I'm digging, what they going to uh, get? What they going to get? Not getting any audio Stacey. anywhere. I'm digging Stacy's background, and Scott's is pretty awesome too. You know, if I I actually do not have a laptop, and if I did, I'd be in some little uh, corner, you know, somewhere, and all you could see <laughs> is my my corner and my cup of coffee. But um, so here I am. No, I like it. Many leather bound books. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very many important books and spot on. <laughs> like Dr. Seuss. Very and, important. Very important. Uh, you know, my actually, it's true. My husband is a uh, he's a little bit of a pack rat. He's never found a he's never seen a book that he wanted to ever get rid of. So <laughs> <laughs> got a lot of dusty books around here. That's for sure. <coughs> Bob, did you get your audio all figured out? I'm guessing not. Bob, can you not hear? Can we get a thumbs up from everybody that can hear? Can you see me? Councilwoman uh, uh, Moore, I cannot see you, and I don't think our mayor can hear us. Bob, Bob just texted, he said he's not getting any audio. I can hear you guys, but you guys can't see me. No. So no, we can. How many? We all, all just take my voice today. <laughs> we'll take what we can get. <laughs> oh, you want Apparently. me to start this thing over? I think no. you're fine, Shelly. Yeah, you're fine, Shelly. Okay, good. Thank you. Still not getting any audio. Bruce or somebody, will somebody call the mayor on his cell phone maybe? I would say Bob probably needs to reconnect. All right. Let me call him. <clears throat> Just disconnect and reconnect probably the best way. Turn it, turn it, turn it, yeah, go ahead. Restart it. Yeah. There you are. There I am. I I'm had a, a few teenagers. <laughs> my laptop, something, maybe lightning hit it and knocked it off or something, but it came back on. Oh, good. Well, we are here. Okay. Indeed. Let's get started. All right. Well, thank you all for being here. Um, Mayor, did you have any comments to start out with, or we just want to go jump right in? We're no, I jump right in. I'm glad everybody's here, and uh, I think we can get a lot accomplished this morning and this afternoon, and uh, we need to get started. So let's get it going. All right, I'm going to start out. Um, uh, first of all, just want to give you a little flavor of the day. Our strategy is uh, to have two. Uh, we, we've allowed a two-hour sessions. We don't have two hours of of information to present. So there's not gonna be two hours of presentation uh, on purpose because our intent here today is to really uh, facilitate discussion. And so we really want um, everyone to be fully engaged and ask questions and make comments and, and give us uh, opinions and share opinions uh, because um, that's what a retreat is about. It's about having the time to really uh, think about issues deeper than just um, here's the information. Um, do you want to do this or not? It's uh, it really is. So we're going to be talking about some things that uh, we don't have figured out. Uh, we we uh, are working on them. Um, some of them are more developed than others. The morning session, uh, there is seemingly more um, work done 
in the afternoon it's it's really more future and and um, some some ideas are growing and really I want to share those and then uh, get your your uh, your opinion and your um, and your input so um, that's the reason we tried to send as much of this information as we could before the meeting started. Um, so I know you got uh, kind of slammed with a bunch of information. Um, we have sent things that we're not gonna talk about at all unless you have questions about them. Uh, the monthly project report is something you normally get, uh, but we did get it out a couple of days early so you would have it coming into this meeting. Um, we did a COVID-19 uh, update that shows the, our costs and the things that we've submitted for CARES funding and sort of our cost to date, give you an idea of where that is, and um, as well as what our structure looks like and how that's going. So you, you got a, a four, four page report, I believe, of that. Uh, we also included what we call Budget 101. Typically, uh, every other year in, in um, council retreats, we share this information just about budgets and about how they interact and about the different pots of money and and uh, again i know we went over some of that when we did the budget before um and then we did the budget so we didn't feel like this is something we needed to go but i think we thought it was good information for you to have and refer to um especially if you haven't been been to it before so that that we provided so all those three things we we provided and, and won't be talking about then we provided also, uh, the council handbook, which I'm going to talk about a little bit in a minute, uh, our, our current charter, just so you have an electronic copy of that. And then we provided the parks update and the violent crime data that we'll be dealing with this morning. And then we also provided um, the comp plan uh, from this afternoon. Um, if we get an opportunity sometime during the day, I am prepared to talk a little bit about legislation. legislation and uh, kind of what the maybe some things in the in the, this upcoming uh, next year's legislation session might might uh, talk about. Uh, and then I just have a couple of quick items I did want to cover uh, this morning regarding budget. Um, primarily, it's about um, you know what are where we are with uh, with income regarding COVID. Uh, uh, we've done some analysis. Uh, John has looked at our top uh, retail um, uh, payers uh, in, in sales tax. And uh, if you look at our uh, top, I um, can't remember how many it is, top 50 or something retail um, uh, t sales tax receipts um, and compare them to last year, uh, March, April, May, um, if you cum accumulate that, we're basically um, about ninety-five thousand dollars short for those three months. So when you're talking about the big, the big retailers, um, COVID has had uh, very little, uh, really very little impact uh, to that because you know a lot of reasons for that. Some of it is the um, uh, the uh, stimulus checks came out, and a lot of people use those and and then there's uh been a lot of activity at uh at, at a lot of these big boxes and uh, a lot of people used uh, their stimulus tax to do um, updates around their house and so lowe's did very well and uh and places like that uh so so from our perspective those first three months uh are going you know better than we expected Although I do uh, would would caution that this analysis is just those top um, those top earners. Those top earners make up seventy five percent of our sales tax. So you, now, so that doesn't take into account the bottom twenty five percent. The bottom twenty five percent, I think you know, if you just look at it from a um, anecdotal evidence, a lot of those businesses shut down in, in March. Some of them never came back. And some of them were to June before they came back or started to come back. So a lot of those small businesses may, you know, that that may add up to be more than a 95% uh, or $95,000 loss. So we're a little cautious, but uh, feel good about uh, the data that we do have and uh, and feel that that uh, we, the amount of money we set aside is more than sufficient to take care of, of that. 
the other side of, of COVID that, um, that affected our, our income in a big way is uh, parks and recreation. So those same months, March, April, and May, um, we normally take in um, about 1.1 million, 1.2 million. And those, those months, we, we ended up taking in about 748,000. So that's about a $400,000, um, loss in revenue. Um, if you look a little deeper, about a hundred, a little over a hundred thousand of that was Sportsplex. So if you recall with Sportsplex, we did have, you know, we do have a, a balance of money from the restaurant tax that we knew the ramping up, you know, to get to break even. Uh, so that money can be covered out of that. Uh, the other 300,000, um, we also have some lowered expenses. So we, we hired, uh, very few or no um, part-time help for most of those months, uh, so there's a so there's there's a savings there and um, other savings of materials and things. So we haven't yet got those things. Um, we think that's going to bring that uh, three hundred thousand dollar deficit down significantly. Um, so if you look at those months, um, I think um, we're better than we thought we were going to be. Um, we also projected about six to eight months of significant impact to this income. Um, as I look at it now, I think it's probably going to be longer than that. Um, but I do believe, you know, if these first three months, which were pretty catastrophic, I think uh, we, we set in a, in a better position and a stronger, much stronger position than what I thought we would. Um, so I wanted you to, to be aware of that. Uh, we'll keep you updated as far as that goes. Um, we have not transferred any money from the emergency account yet. Um, you know, this three, four hundred thousand dollars. We haven't haven't had a need to do that yet. Uh, when we get ready to do that, we'll let you know. Um, but uh, we did want to want to make you aware of that. Um, if you remember, the other emergency account we did was the um, was a cyber attack. Um, our cost for the cyber attack, uh, when you have the, our, our insurance deductible, uh, some new uh, virus software, uh, some cloud storage, and some reinstallation and reconfiguration of some software, which is our main, main cost that we had, that totaled about $250,000. Um, and um, so we will probably soon make that transfer. Um, so that was less than what we had asked for at the time. And so we're, we're glad to report that. So I uh, just wanted to update you on those items because uh, we had promised that when we made those moves uh, to access the emergency uh, funds that we would keep you informed uh, as far as the progress of that. And um, as we move forward, we'll get more and more data and uh, understand it even more. But um, any questions regarding uh, that, uh, emergency fund use and COVID and cybersecurity. I'm really just happy to know that it hasn't impacted some of those largest or, uh, largest retail outlets as badly as I was expecting it to. Um, mm -hmm. We're not on the other side of it yet, so just kind of staying flexible and staying limber with this, just seeing how it all goes and plays out over the next couple of months will be essential. But, uh, but at least that's, that's a good sign. Yeah. Well, Scott, I, for the sake of the group, you know, I think the county, can you speak to the differences in sales and the reporting? I think if you, if we've read recently, the county has, their numbers are, uh, look to be somewhat positive, so to speak. And, and where's the difference between that and ours and how the reporting is if you wouldn't mind county yeah. has, county has a use tax you got to remember and it's up 80 percent so that's big that's uh, yeah true I, I, Which, uh, everybody's buying everything online now so yeah uh, that, that's a big, uh probably also uh, when it comes to a lot of the small small businesses but um uh, there's that and then also if you look at our our month to month comparisons um, you know, they're, they're up too. So, um, but, but the problem with those is you're not apples and apples. And so that's the reason we, 
we really dug deep into the actual top uh, retail to, to get a real feel for what that was because um, for what was actually going on in our in our in, the, in that top of our economy it, it really that we again we don't know about the the, low, the small retailers but um, but you know for instance if you have five five weekends in a in a month and then the next year you have four weekends in that same month, you know, you're, you, it's going to be down and you yeah. flip it, it's going to be up. Um, so there's a lot of factors that go into, into that. Uh, car sales is another one that, that uh, varies quite a bit. So um, we try to, uh, we try to come out, but uh, and, and, uh, the, the analysis we feel really strong about, uh, but there's still yet some, some things to uh, be, to be concerned about. That's the best I know, Robbie. No, thank you. I would just, and I and thank you, Mayor. I I I wasn't when I'm reading, seeing those numbers. I I wasn't taking the use tax into consideration as well. Scott, I have a question. The um, regarding the uh, small business data is that captured more like with the Chamber of Commerce or um, you know, just the in terms of the the health or you know. Uh, status of, of small businesses around um well the Ready? we get a certain amount of of data from the um department of revenue and it depends on how they report and so we don't track the small businesses there's a lot of variation in their data anyway mm -hmm. so small businesses a lot of times will pay quarterly or they get behind and then they tr catch up. And so, so there's not a lot of reliability to that data. So we don't, so we've never really relied on it much. It's, it, it, it's somewhat there, but, and it's all, it's just hard to capture. Most of the big data is, is, um, is reported and paid automatically through their systems. And so it's much better. So it's easier to track and, and, and uh, for us to get that data and for it to be consistent. Um, month to month and year to year, I know it's maybe maybe not <laughs> exactly what you're asking, but but uh, the data is harder to 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 really analyze and and understand year to year with small businesses. Small businesses, small businesses come and go between years and years, and so uh, that's that's the reason why we rely so heavily on on that first top seventy five percent. Sure. Well, and everybody would notice if the Walmart or Lowe's you know shut down here in Cape, right. but. But yeah, you know, noticing, noticing, you know, the fluctuation of, of small businesses that opens or closes or whatever is, is you know, you just, you just don't observe that um, as easily. But I'm just wondering if there's any, you know, what entity in Cape would, apart from the, the hard data, you know, the, the numbers, yeah. just um, how do we, how do we kind of know, have our finger on the pulse of, you know, how small businesses in general are doing in Cape Girardeau, I guess. Yeah, we, and I've had conversations with uh, the chamber and, uh, you know, John and I have talked about it and, you know, uh, certainly anecdotally, we know that we've lost some small businesses that probably won't yeah. come back. Um, uh, some of them had some really difficult times. Uh, June, of course, June is, do you remember, was when we started to open back up. Um, so, uh, we've we've seen uh, some of that, but primarily that 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 is anecdotal. Uh, but I'll, you know, we can we can ask them a little more information, and we will we will get more. You know, we can kind of accumulate that that data and and do the comparisons. Uh, certainly, we're concerned about it, and uh, that's the reason we're uh, advocating for using the CARES funding to help small businesses and and all the small business grants and all of that to try to keep them going. We've not talked about the uh, hotel, motel, and restaurant tax either. That's a yeah, yeah. That's that's yeah, a significant. It's going, a big, it's going to be significant. Yeah, we um, yeah we haven't, but uh, we uh, you know suspended some of the the need to report those, and so um, and gave them some time. So that's um, we don't have as good a data with that as either. But you're, you're exactly right. That's that's another um, that's another area that is uh, vulnerable. That um, hopefully they can start coming back to. 
Any other questions? Great questions. Appreciate it. <laughs> All right. Well, I wanted to talk a little bit and don't want to harp too much on it, but uh, we did have um, a, I did share with you our city council handbook. Um, uh, it, a lot of the handbook things are things directly from our, our charter, which we also um, shared uh, an electronic copy with you. Um, but, uh, a lot of things that you've experienced, uh, those of you have been on for several years, you probably didn't find much in there that you hadn't already experienced, but sometimes it helps to, to just have a reminder. And so I just wanted to take a little bit of time uh, this morning and trying to watch the clock uh, and talk a little bit about uh, our council handbook and, and charter. Uh, certainly when you, when you look at representing the city, um, you know, our mayor is recognized as the head of the city uh, for legal ceremonial emergency uh, calling of military law. Um, the mayor is that person and um, uh, the mayor is a ceremonial leader, you know, handing out resolutions, things like that. Um, so, but, uh, but when it comes to uh, negotiations, uh, no member of council can represent or negotiate for the city because because negotiations are um, ultimately controlled by the body of the council. So it, it's, the, it's the council who can do those negotiations. Now, sometimes uh, council meets and says, we'd like the mayor or we'd like this council member or two or three council members to talk to a developer or something. Most of the time it comes through staff. Staff, uh, either through Magnet or through the city, uh, we talk to a developer and then we bring things to to council, some of those are eligible for uh, closed session, and we have those negotiations and talk with them. But just um, and we, you know, just a reminder that uh, no member can just represent the represent the council. You all, there are seven votes. The mayor's vote doesn't count more than anybody else's, and um, and your uh, when it comes to actually taking action, um, the way our charter is set up, um, it takes four positive votes to take action. And uh, at least there are certain conditions that it takes more. But um, so that's just a, a reminder. Um, if, uh, if, if members are contacted by concerning policy decisions or uh, administrative meetings, you can either bring them up at the next meeting or you can uh, notify the city manager and, and let the city manager communicate. Um, and, uh, and the same thing uh, with me, when I get uh, contacted, then I, inform inform council of, of those uh, types of things that might lead to negotiation. So um, when representing the city, it's just something to always keep in mind. And uh, we keep in mind uh, as staff and, uh, and uh, want, want everybody to uh, keep that in mind. It's, it's, we are a little bit unique in that. Some, some uh, charters and things, you know, uh, have the mayor able to make uh, certain decisions and certain uh, certain uh, negotiation things. Our charter does not does not provide for that. It uh, really uh, is a seven seven member council. Um, other than the other duties that I talked about before, um, so uh, another thing uh, we've kind of set up over the years is this idea that we really want ideas and new. Um, directions uh, um, to emerge and, and, and come before council in the study session. So um, if, if we want to think about a new way of doing things or new, that, that that should be, you know, our idea is to present those in the study session, then um, staff usually then is, is instructed to go do some work and then come back and then we come back to study session a lot of times and then it becomes a discussion and then it gets into the regular session where action takes place. And so that does. Now some things that are, that are um, transitional and made nature, administrative in nature, things that we do all the time, those things oftentimes show up in, um, in our consent agenda, you know, to do an agreement with somebody or to, uh, or to uh, uh, take in uh, plats and, and do things like that. That, that is done uh, with our, our uh, consent agenda because the consent agenda is more um, 
routine, or it's the second and third reading of something that went to the first reading in the previous meeting. Our, our, count, our charter calls for uh, things to be passed with three readings uh, and that those three readings be done uh, at two separate meetings. And so that's where we do the one reading in the first meeting and then the second and third in the, uh, in the second meeting. Um, there are conditions whereby you can do all three readings for an emergency reading, and, and it happens that way. There's certain conditions that have to be meet, met, and in an emergency, um, you have to have a supermajority for those uh, to pass. Um, uh, when it comes to the agenda, I know uh, uh, items uh, can be brought uh, forward for the agenda. Um, usually, staff brings forward most of the agenda. But if you have items that you want to be on the agenda, we are, it's been our practice in the past to have uh, you contact the mayor. The mayor, uh, through his own motion, can add something to the agenda. Um, if there's a condition where um, a few mayor, a few council members want to do it, and um, the mayor doesn't, then uh, I believe we've said uh, that uh, three, if three council members uh, want something added to the agenda, we will add it. Um, you know, we feel like uh, that's that's a good thing. The other the other uh, opportunity you have to add to the agenda is the night the night of the meeting. If you have something that you want added to our agenda for that evening, you can make a motion when you adopt the agenda and say, "I would like to add this item to our agenda." And with the majority vote of council, an item can be added. Now, there's certain things, actions that can't take place because if they require a public hearing or certain things or notice then there's certain items that you can't actually take action on uh, because of restrictions, but many items you can. So uh, that's just to know kind of how that works. Um, I'm not gonna go over the ordinances, resolutions, and motions. Uh, you pretty well have got all of those and, and dealt with those. Um, uh, and, and how the procedures and debate at council meetings, I'm trying to save a little time here, um, uh, you know pretty much. Our, our, our budget really drives a lot of what we do. And uh, basically, John always uh, breaks up the budget in two parts of the, of the year. Uh, the part we're in now from July to December is he calls the auditing time when we are auditing the previous year's budget and, and getting a, uh, and learning from that and planning that. And then January one starts the development of the new budget. And so that's the time when we're developing the budget, we develop the, the capital improvement plan, and all of those things to come forward. And that, that's a really a critical thing uh, for council because that really is a time to look at everything we're doing and, um, and decide what are, what are the priorities. So what gets funded gets done, what doesn't get funded doesn't get done. And so um, that's, that's a time and uh, we have a process for um, proposing a budget and um, getting it approved as well as the capital improvement plan, which is developed and they're quite a, a, a good guiding uh, uh, document. Uh, the capital improvement plan when I came here was kind of a list of, of uh, a wish, wish list of things we'd like to do. Um, it is now developed into a five year fiscal constrained plan with different, uh, several different functions that we really look at. And in those five years, we have identified funds that we think are reasonable and can be, uh, and, and those things will be able to move forward. Uh, we only allow twice that amount of money or about 10 years worth of money uh, on the uh, contingent plan. So it's, so it really gives us direction. And, uh, and we, it took us a while to really dial into that. We, I think we had too many projects in there uh, at one point where we were doing things a thousand dollars and less. Eh, we, we don't need that in the capital improvement plan. But um, so we, we've learned. And I think what you have now is a really good, uh, really good part. Um, Quickly, um, conflicts of interest. Every council member is required uh, to file an annual financial disclosure statement with Missouri Ethics. And then uh, I know Eric uh, visits with each of you as you come on board regarding uh, conflicts of interest and just declaring them. And so you, uh, when you have a conflict, you need to declare it uh, clearly. And uh, when you have a conflict, not only do you, uh, do you, uh, abstain from voting, you also abstain from the discussion. So you cannot, you cannot be a part of that discussion. I know and some, sometimes uh, 
Um, in some councils, they actually members will get up and leave during the during the discussion. I, we've never taken that as a as a necessary thing, but it may, if it makes you feel more comfortable, you're certainly welcome to do so. Um, but I think uh, people have seen me go through that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but um, it is something, and, and also code of uh, code of conduct, and conflicts of interest, and all that is a self monitoring uh, function. So. You know, you, you, you are to, to monitor yourself. Um, we do visit with all of our, um, all of our boards about every other year um, and go over conflicts and, and uh, those types of things with them um, to make sure that they understand and are abiding by those things. Um, code of conduct, uh, the, the uh, handbook does talk about code of conduct. You know, it's um, one of the things that really is tough right now to be a public official is that uh, we've kind of lost in a lot of ways our um, uh, just the decorum of respect that in the past was always in most um, governing bodies. And, um, uh, you know, the part of it's emotion. I, I understand that, um, but it's really uh, a hard uh, thing. But we really, um, one of the things that our handbook does ask and want you to do is to uh, conduct yourselves as examples. So when everybody else isn't under control, uh, when you sh show control and respect and listen, and uh, then that helps. Uh, that helps somewhat keep the uh, keep keep the, uh, the conduct of the meeting uh, in that respectful manner. And I know it's been tough right recently when uh, people are attacking and uh, things can get said emotionally to you, um, but I do appreciate uh, you know, your ability to, to just uh, be above it. And, um, and so those things are in there and, and uh, I'll give you some, some uh, guidance and suggestions for dealing with that. So I took probably a little more time overall than I wanted to, but uh, any questions about uh, our handbook or our charter? Um, Mine would just be a statement and that is, you know, I, I, carry, I carry the city charter with me to, uh, all the time. It's a it's a great point of reference on on just different things and and I I'd, I'd urge you know I'd I'd urge all council members to the the council uh, handbook and the charter keep them close I mean I, I just there's certain things I've had to look up over the last four years that I I probably look at it every month to be quite frank so it's just it's good to have it there and and. And I think Scott said this before, you know, the, the city charter is, it's a, it's a living document to me. And, and, you know, and I, I know that we had talked about before COVID it, we had talked about, you know, maybe looking at some things within the charter. I don't know with everything we've got going on right now. I don't think it's the time, but I do look forward in the next couple of years to maybe looking at the charter and see, see what things we need to, to update. Um, the last charter, and Eric would have to speak to this, but the last time we had any uh, a charter, have we ever really had a charter review and what amendments to the charter, Eric? Scott? We, we have had a charter review. And when was that, Scott or Eric? Yes, we have had a charter review committee. It was in 1994. Uh, the, uh, it's more beneficial uh, frequently uh, to have the, the city council do those, uh, uh, those requests themselves uh, frequently, just to be frank, because you never know what will come out of a committee like that, and it's difficult to not proceed with whatever their recommendations are. But, um, but the city council can 
propose recommendations to uh, change the city charter themselves. And all they have to do in those circumstance, circumstances is, uh, is pass an ordinance to call an election uh, to make changes on those points. City staff can, uh, can um, give indications of some things where there have been changes in law or, or possible changes that can be made, but the council can make those calls themselves. Okay, thank you. I, I, we had talked about it and I just thought, and it's been 26 years. I mean, it's probably something over the next few years, you know, no offense, Scott, but our next city manager, maybe we need to tackle that then. Well, it, it's been one of my goals this year to, to, to have staff look at the charter. Uh, it's going to require hiring uh, outside expertise, I think, uh, to look at all those things and look at the things in our in our charter that we have that uh, uh, need to be changed because state laws change to bring it up to date. Uh, but the biggest thing I'd like to see change, and I think we've heard this suggestion before, uh, would be to change our budget pro our budget requirement from a yearly budget to a uh, biannual budget and do it every two years. That way, you could do it in those off years when you don't have a new council member coming on and immediately have to approve a budget right after you're elected in April. To me, that seems unfair uh, to a council member uh, to bring them on board and have them approve a, a budget that's important for our city when they don't, they haven't been here for long enough to, to know that much about it. So that's a big thing. Yeah, yeah there are, there's that and then there's, um, there's several that are just changes in the state law. That, um, our election schedule is half, uh, not half, but several of the election dates are not no longer available to us uh, because of the change in the state statute. So that's something, you know, it seems like an easy change to make to, to put ourselves in line with that. So, um, yeah, we, we're looking at, um, at uh, the cost to codify our code and get the, and when they codify the code, they'll also look at the charter and see things that are, um that are out of date so that's that's a that's the start of that and uh and then we'll bring bring that forward but it would be, it would be nice to have that up to date when you bring in a a new city manager absolutely anything else seeing none i will um ask julia to uh uh, talk about um, parks projects um, in particular, looking for my agenda, um, in particular about uh, the Jefferson Aquatic Center, the Central Pool update, our um, downtown restroom and neighborhood parks, and the youth ball field complex. Um, I believe she, uh, that was provided, some information was provided for you. Um, uh, I also asked Julie to talk a little bit about the school city um, operating agreement, not only for this for the pool, but you know we've had some discussions about sharing uh, facilities. You know, maybe starting it in the Jefferson, and then maybe even going to other other schools. Um, but uh, we'll turn it over to her and let her uh, uh, lead this discussion. Again, we're looking for um, not just a, a monologue, but a dialogue with you. So, Julia, if you'll uh, take us through that. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. How are you? Good morning. Good morning. Great. Great. So uh, Scott asked me to give an update on some of the projects that you're aware that we've been working on, and I believe you have a handout in front of you. So I'll start with the Jefferson uh, Aquatic Facility Project. Uh, we are still in a uh, design phase um, with that project. It's not just the pool. It is um, the expansion of that whole facility. So there's a lot of moving parts and trying to fit everything in in a way that um, makes sense for flow and operations and public access and then the infrastructure uh, surrounding it that will be needed. So we have another meeting uh, coming up shortly, I believe next week. I think we're getting very close to finalizing that design. Uh, I asked if I could share some of the 
ideas with you all today, knowing that um, we were going to be talking about this, but they were like, no, because some things may change and that would, you know, um, might disappoint some folks. So just know that we are making progress um, uh, with that facility. We've been uh, pretty uh, aggressively uh, working on that schedule. Uh, with them. They have a very quick timeline to uh, start construction, which is um, what they hope to be is the beginning of 2021. Uh, so any particular questions about that project? It's not just the aquatics facility, um, but of course it encompasses all of their Jefferson School um, improvements. I think it's great they're moving ahead and uh, I like their uh, their design and operational goals uh, where every student learns to swim I think that's important I think that's something that they've gotten away from and uh, <clears throat> you know I think there is a lot of partnership possibilities there for revenue uh, for us uh, so I I think it's a good it, it's an aggressive schedule I will say that to get a lot done in that in that period of time. I didn't know whether anyone had heard, but they are trying to find funds to move away from that original sprung structure, and they are looking to try to put a permanent hard structure over um, the facility, over the aquatics portion. Yeah. Um, but it's a very tight it's a tight budget, but they are trying to find ways to accomplish that. Wow, excellent. Julie, I had a question. Uh, I think the success of our new feature in Kappa Hall Park uh, has been overwhelming. And uh, wonder if there are, there's ever been any talk of any other plans to do uh, any of those in any other park areas in the city? Right, we wanted to see how this one worked out. We had a bunch of Kind of worries at the beginning like it was either going to be overrun or um, people were going to damage it or uh, you know just a variety of things that was going to um, you know create an attractive nuisance we've been pleasantly surprised that none of those things have materialized yet um, people i drive by there, by there almost every single day and i've not heard one negative report from anyone complaining uh, about it yet. Now, maybe not everybody's aware of it, uh, but it it's been well utilized. Um, people are taking care of it. The worst thing that has happened to date is um, Lucas Presson called me. He's a big fan of Kapaha, and he goes, there's a basketball stuck in the water bucket feature, and it's not pouring properly. <laughs> that's, that's been about it, <laughs> but thank you. That's the worst. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it is it, it's a unique feature, and uh, it's free for the residents, uh, and it's uh, used by. I mean, every time I drive by there, it's just packed, and it's yeah. it's uh, it's neat. They um, are about a half a million dollars. You don't have to get them that large. Um, that's a sixty foot diameter, and it has a lot of elements to it, and you can't just throw a splash pad in there, of course. You have to have the infrastructure that goes along with it. Uh, plumbing, you have to determine where you're gonna drain it. Um, ours is draining into the pond, but it's, uh, it's filtered through uh, a treatment system so that chlorine doesn't go uh, directly into the pond. So there's a lot of things to consider, but I think they're very um, economical in a way that maybe an aquatic center doesn't quite reach even though you're not charging admission i think you could place some of these um, splash pads all around the city and have a nice amenity in in uh, many different park locations the need amenity for sure um, julia just getting back to the um the jefferson complex uh, i i do really appreciate seeing under the design and operational goals just the part about integrating seamlessly between the school and community usage and programming that's we've had conversations and um, that's just a, a huge part of you know what I've heard uh, the community you know being being interested and concerned about so um, just really glad to see that there and looking forward to seeing it in practice certainly I think you'll I think you'll find that in the very near future 
you will see a lot more real synergy between Jefferson, Shawnee, and the whole parks and recreation uh, service delivery system. We're working to put those things in place in a more sustainable manner, building up those relationships. And I feel confident that we are moving in a direction that I feel as Stacy, I know our conversations um, uh, through the foundation and some of the other things that we've talked about, Get, garnering more financial support um, to, because one of the most challenging things is to be able to, and we've identified this from the very beginning, um, with some of the challenges with Shawnee is transportation mm -hmm. and funding. And then we are trying to, uh, we are getting a new actual, uh, a, a new bus um, uh, van, larger van this year. So we are looking to label it as wreck and roll and um, <laughs> wrap it so that we are able to transport kids um, to locations so that we can, uh -huh. uh, or we can take recreation to certain neighborhoods and do um, little mini special events or mini activities um, so that that doesn't become or doesn't remain a barrier for uh, all areas of our community to experience um, some fun and recreation services. Great. That's all great to hear. Thanks. All right, so, I'll move on. Uh, uh, Julia? Mm -hmm. um, I know you. I know you can't. Rec I can know you can't really talk about all the design features, but um, if you go back to the to the uh, design, uh, you know co the concept that originally was there. Um, are they going to be able to to do essentially about as much as the what the concept was, or is it is it expanded or is it less? Is, is that too much uh, too much detail to ask about just to get no. a feel for that? No, right now it looks like, because um, we've been uh, really wanting to make sure that we have as much of the attractive fun amenities in that pool as possible. So right now it looks like we'll, we're down to about three lanes of swimming, which allows us, which should be fine. We're, I think we're all fine with that, um, which allows us to invest more in um, the amenities. Um, so we've got a large splash pad, some bubblers, a slide. Um, so I think it looks very similar. We're still, I think, at about 4,000 uh, square feet of usable um, in, in the pool itself, not counting, you know, deck space and storage and meeting rooms. And so we should be really getting close to being able to share something like that. So I believe it's about the same. Um, right. Same thing that we've been talking about. Constructing Thanks. the school at the same time will enable them to utilize some of that space, uh, whether there's locker rooms or storage or meeting rooms or whatnot, and make them more multi-purpose. Yes. What has cost? They've also added a um, the design team. I think they saw how successful the splash pad at Kapaha was. So in a future phase or as an addendum, they've added a splash pad outside Jefferson for us to consider that as well. That'd be great. Great place to put one. So uh, just moving down to talk a little bit about the central municipal pool. Um, we finished the evaluation through the consultants and the structural folks um, for that facility. And you'll see some numbers here. They basically narrowed it down to three options of what they're proposing. Option one is really just replacing the mechanical features that right now have a potential to fail. So I don't really know that that is something that we're all that interested in at this point because um, it doesn't get us anything new. It just kind of repairs the mechanical systems of what we, we've got, but they wanted to give that as an option uh, just so that we could evaluate everything um, in that facility. Option two is the most reasonable for our budget. Um, that includes keeping the concrete slab, which they found to be in uh, excellent condition, um, but replacing the walls and the decking adding the sprung structure, the HVAC, um, the pool mechanical room is included in all of that with a 
pretty hefty contingency because it is a renovation project. Um, adding in design fees, and then so that makes that total right around that you know six million that we have budgeted, and um, so it, it still is going to be a tight you know a tight budget. Um, the option three would be a complete pool replacement that you know bumps things up about a million and a half. Um, that's not currently within our budget, so that's something that we're hoping that we don't have to go to. Um, they did send a caveat with regards to the pool slab that if we were to select option two, that um, a more thorough examination of the slab uh, would need to be taken into consideration. Um, and they were not able to make that determination during this evaluation because they would have had to drill uh, down into areas of the slab. Um, uh, even if they did the um, ground penetrating radar, it still would have had to have been verified. Uh, Scott and I had talked a little bit about that, but um, so right now we are recommending that um, we take a look at that option two um, whenever we're ready to start that project, um, which I think was after we have gotten the Jefferson uh, facility completed and operational. So, you know, that could be 20, um, into 2021 into 2022. Any like questions? Mm -hmm. the, uh, I was just gonna throw in real quick that the option two does also include not uh, getting rid of the, of the waiting pool. So there's a little waiting pool, but with the other options we have for for that, we didn't didn't uh, want to invest uh, in keeping that. It, and it also doesn't make any improvements to the bathhouse. Right. Oh, the option two doesn't. No, it's just the pool. But option three does. Option three does not. That's just a complete pool replacement. But as far as whenever on option two, Julia, is there one of the concerns of the swimming community was more deck space for those events and things will that will 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 we have more deck space with the sprung structure mm -hmm. will that okay so there yeah. will be some of those concerns will be addressed with that option two at least right the sprung structure um the way it's set up is a has much more vertical space as opposed to where the bubble you know, it goes mm -hmm. like this. So it'll seem like more space, but I think even in the renovation aspect, we can spread some things out a little bit more. There's, there's not a lot of room. We're, we're contained pretty tightly uh, in that area, but I think for sure the sprung structure will allow um, a lot more space. Okay. So when you're talking the concrete slab, when you're referring to that, is that the underwater pool surface floor surface or is that the deck space slab that goes around it that's the underwater pool surface at the very bottom just take away all the walls and it's just the bottom slab of the pool but you're addressing the deck surface on both option two and three right yes but there's no way yeah. to expand that necessarily i'm sorry you have to, like you have to replace it because to the walls are are stainless steel um, metal with um, bracing behind them. So you have to take out the 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 deck in order to install those. So you're going to get new deck no matter what you do. And um, adding is just um, it's kind of, it's cost prohibitive to to add significantly. But the but the wall structures will will make it uh, will will add some as well as the other big concern they had was um, was uh, air quality and that's going to improve significantly. What did they, uh, what was found regarding the walls, um, Julia? The, they... So if you can imagine, I'll, I'll forward the um, report so that you can look at everything um, specifically. And what happens with the pool wall, here's the water. So there's framing, framing back here underground that is holding that in place. 
it's bowed and the, the seams and bolts have popped away on the deepest portions of the pool um, where the diving well is and then on the north side of the pool. Um, they've all the bolts, um, you can see it just have because they've rusted around where they've become detached from the framing uh, have just popped out. Surprisingly, the uh, company that does this has done a lot of uh, evaluations and pools of this nature. Um, they were actually pretty amazed that the pool was in as good a shape as it is. So the replacement would be same type of walls? Similar. There, there are systems. I've, I've got um, a company that's really been on me for the last three years. Mirtha is known to come in and uh, do this type of pool replacement. It's what they do. It's one of their specialties. Um, and so uh, I've got more detailed information if you're interested in that. Julia, what were the estimates uh, for the uh, some of the things we, we could not do, like the, the bathhouse part? Mm, I think that is probably over a million. If you, it depends on if you wanted to demolish the structure. Um, there's probably some things that uh, we need to, you know, redo within the office areas um, to make it more functional. Um, but you're probably looking at, you know, a million to two million on a brand new building. Okay. That possible to be done at a separate iteration, connected. Yes. To yes. And then the other question I had was, it, with the waiting pool not being addressed, is that going to be under roof, or will it not be? No, actually, we would probably demolish the waiting pool. Um, one of the things that I talked to Scott about that we could pr potentially do at a different phase would be to add a splash pad to central that would be seasonal um, that adds more of that shallow water like what that <coughs> wading pool entails and it's a big attractive feature for you know parents with young children um, to be able to go and have fun instead of worrying about you know keeping tabs on them in that deeper water so i think that would be a good location for a splash pad in the future well, you have to remember our strategy here was to address competition aquatics with the central pool and recreational aquatics with the Jefferson pool. So, um, you know, we're focused on the, the primary thing we're focused on, we're spending most, almost all of our money on is that 50 meter pool that, 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 uh, that the um, competitions uh, swimmer said that they needed. So, we're providing a, a quality uh, competition pool with a semi-permanent structure over it and good air quality. And that's, you know, that's, that, that, that's how we got to where we are because we didn't, didn't try to make this two things. We, tried, we made it one and then we made the other one at Jefferson. And so when we're talking about recreational swimming, we're talking about people going to Jefferson and the Cape Splash. I think it's important to, to, to note though, Scott, I mean, the, the, the HVAC situation there, um, you know, just the atmosphere is, is um, it's been really bad. I mean, kids have, kids have kind of gotten sick and, and that's, you know, almost as well, no, it's not as, uh, it's a large cost and it, for good reason, you know. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, and so I, I think that's what people need, people who don't go there, don't understand um, and, and, and it's a large part of the price tag and for, for good reason. I mean, it's an important part of it. So, yep. anyway. All right, any more questions about Central? I just have one more point of uh, clarification. So is the option two and three, we get to choose between those or is it dependent upon what the findings are on the pool surface? Well, I'm assuming uh, maybe that's wrong that just because of our budget situation that option two is is I kind of put a little star by that That's the one that probably matches up as well with our budget uh, Moving forward and of course that's in 2020 dollars 
Um, option three is certainly up for consideration if you know additional funds could be found, but this project has been, you know, both projects have been tight uh, from the very beginning. But you know, if that Mirtha company specializes in that type of pool replacement, it's probably the the, the quality of the uh, of the end product is probably pretty high, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and if you had an additional million, would you spend that on on the full replacement, or would you spend that on maybe a, a more permanent uh, uh, structure rather than the sprung structure? So, I mean, you know, if you were going to add a million dollars, you, you might want to ask that question. Or would you want to spend it on the bathhouse part and, and have and my, my question project. was whether it that we whether that was contingent upon an unknown or whether why we had the two options like is we may end up having to go to option three if the full surface is found to not be up to par and that's not the case is what you're saying right now it is not but it still may be an unknown that's why there's a fairly large analyzes. yeah that's why there's a fairly large contingency amount in that option well all the options actually since it's a renovation their, their report looked really, really heavily, at, and again, they were really impressed with the condition of the, of the slab, um, and they don't see anything that, that indicates um, any kind of voids underneath or anything. So, I mean, where we are right now, that, but like I said, that's the reason you have a contingency, and, um, and we, and, you know, we were, we wanted them to give us an option that fit our budget, you know, so. That's what we can afford right now. Remember, we had six million dollars to start with, so that's that's pretty close. Yep. We have just a little bit less than that. We've paid for both of those studies, so we're you know a little under six million right now. Okay, we're still we're a lot closer than seven and a half. Yeah. Or seven point six. All right. Good job. All right. Thank you. Um, moving on to the downtown restrooms. I think everybody's probably been by uh, either the one at um, the near the Red House uh, and uh, Indian Park. Uh, those utility connections are currently happening over the next couple of weeks. You're going to see uh, Nip Kelly's crew do some excavating to make those sewer connections, which are pretty far underground. So we had to hire that a job to out to Nick Kelly to get accomplished. So we're hoping that by, you know, mid to late August, those restrooms will be uh, up and operational. The port sidewalks, I think we've made some the electrical connections. Um, any questions about those restrooms? They will be open uh, 24 hours. Um, That's that like all of our restrooms are, you know, during the season. It is. Thank you guys for getting that done. Those are good looking structures. Um, you know, and I just know that those have been things the public have been calling for for a long time. And it takes a long time to get that sort of thing accomplished. But we're finally there. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, the next uh, project that we've been working heavily on as well is the uh, neighborhood park plan for two neighborhood parks in South Cape. Um, we've identified a couple of locations. Um, one of them is adjacent to the House of Hope, which is the old May Green School. Um, they have their large play fields um, adjacent to that church when it was the school. Um, I have a meeting with their pastor on Monday uh, to see if um, they would be interested in partnering with the city on-site development and you know what that would look like and so I'll bring that information back that seemed like a very good location because it's it's walkable it's right adjacent to the school site we know that it already has utilities it's level um, so uh, that was one option um, for that area if we go north of Highway 74 we are looking um, we're trying to find that excitement and that synergy with Jefferson School, could we utilize some of that property adjacent to the school that the city has for um, another neighborhood park um, or take a smaller site? Um, there are smaller lots 
in and around that area, but it won't necessarily accommodate a whole lot. And when I've spoken with uh, the porch group and some of the other constituency groups, uh, they really would love to have an area where they can have a little bit larger pavilion where they can have family functions, um, places where uh, they can serve food, you know, have green space, um, just to have, um, you know, a little bit larger groups that they can't really fit at uh, Indian Park. So we would look to try to fit a pavilion, green space, um, potentially a restroom, playground, you know, walking area, multi-generational playground has been mentioned um, numerous times. So that's where we're at. We haven't firmed up locations for either of those sites yet. Um, and just open to uh, other thoughts and questions about it. Does not rule out the possibility that if there is a future development uh, within South Cape to uh, say, for example, take a six or eight block area uh, and build some new homes and renovate some present homes. There are a lot of vacant lots down there. It uh, doesn't rule out the possibility of having some smaller, just a lot or two uh, areas in other areas that, that you could have a very small, uh, you know, facility. Mm -hmm. We were looking, I know Scott and I've talked a lot about Earl Norman's property and if it were somehow to get redeveloped into mixed use um, that you could seriously integrate some beautiful green space, um, uh, some park sites, you could take Rainy uh, Park and then kind of redevelop, you know, that whole area um, as a master planned site. Um, so that would be you know, the ultimate dream would be able to do something like that and tie in the Fountain Street Community Garden. There's a lot next to that garden that I think, and that sits right below um, uh, the um, larger property and Fort D. So there's a lot of opportunities there. I don't know if they're gonna be within the timing of what everybody would like to see. Um, but if you think big, you know, you never know what can happen. So right. we're trying to keep all that in mind. Good. Any other questions of Julia? I guess the near Jefferson, will that take into account that um, that new College Street construction that's gonna go on there, the extension and maybe tie that all in together? I know there's been some talk about that, but. It would need to do that, yeah. Uh, Shelly, what, what do you hear about uh, possibilities for parks uh, on the south side? Um, uh, we go, you know, I think we're going to need bigger, a bigger park, like uh, Julia was saying, because uh, most of the African American people, they like to do the family thing, and family is big, it's huge. Mm -hmm. uh, they could take one Sunday and all their families that come from different areas just to fellowship with one another. So you would definitely need something that would uh, be able to accommodate them. The other thing is uh, the safety of the kids, and that's we talked about that also, where there may be some small. Uh, lots that we can use and call them top lots for the youth, for the babies and the kids that are, you know, ages anywhere between 10 and 9, 10, 1 to 10 years old, that, where they can go in and their moms could take them in there and they are more safe than being at, a, you know, at a bigger park, park for, you know, the families. They can come in and have a good time there. So, but my thought on it is that you definitely gonna need something that's gonna be able to accommodate those sizes because like on holidays, you got families that are that that are come down and are and then they wanna have outing and then we have nowhere to go because there's nothing to go to, you know, because the Capitol Hall Park is already uh used and uh the arena park is already used and the Indian park is already used, so you really don't have nowhere to go. 
But if we had one over, if one could be put in South Cape, then you would see a great, a great relief. Um, may, maybe as we work with the school too, maybe we can use, um, uh, find some dual use for some of the property around the school, the, the school playground and things in order to maybe add some picnic tables and things and have some of those family events adjacent to the school as well and maybe also adjacent to Shawnee Center. Um, and maybe we can think differently about some of those spaces uh, to make that available. So, because you, you're exactly right, they, you know, uh, I've seen many, many big uh, family events on the south side. So, uh, increasing that's a good idea. Well, I, do, I was driving up and down, you know, taking a look at Walnut on the way to uh, Shawnee. There was a lot of land over there uh, that could be utilized to make a park. But it, that's up to the people that own the land to want to sell it. You understand mm -hmm. what I mean? So, if that would be a good idea, because there is the shiny part, and then you got the family gathering part where it'll uh, hold a lot of people in there so that they can have family time. And I would, I look, I'm, but that's me driving around looking at land. That's nobody has said this is the shell land right here. But because uh, I'm always trying to find uh, a place where we can settle down and be at peace. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, thank you. Uh, lastly, we have been working on developing uh, the strategy for the youth ball field complex. And we have potentially identified at least three locations of what we think would be uh, potential submittals for an RFP similar to like what we did with the uh, sports plaque. So I provided some details of what we would look to replace uh, from removal of those fields uh, here at Arena Park. Um, cer certainly not an exhaustive list, but it provides for those field replacements all in one location, uh, restroom concession area, um, obviously parking, uh, and this would be utilized as an economic impact facility along with our own local community leagues. So we anticipate that hopefully within the next year or so, um, this is a $4.5 million uh, project and that we would put an RFP out to begin to start um, moving in that direction uh, possibly uh, next year. And that wraps up my information. Any additional questions? Uh, Thanks, real quick. Uh, I'm sorry. Real quick, Julia, can you just remind us a little bit about um, what that moving those fields, what that then allows Arena to become? Right. So we had always identified that Arena Park is such a large, underutilized, central uh, location in the city that is perfect for redevelopment into an economic, a larger economic impact facility. Um, so in order to do that though, you know, right now it just has multiple uses where none of them are functioning, you know, all that well within those ball field areas. So in order to renovate um, Arena Park, we have to remove all those ball fields in the middle of the park. Um, and then begin to develop special event space that would uh, not only complement fair usage, but other expo and large event, outside event usage, whether it be agriculture, whether it be um, bazaars, antique marts, flea markets, RV shows, that type of thing where you can really utilize arena as that large venue event that will again add to you know, our sales tax, our restaurant and, and hotel tax. Um, and then again, you would be getting more functional youth ball field facilities in a way that's a tournament attractor um, from around the region. So it really takes both into consideration for a win win <coughs> as far as um, bringing in more revenue, you know, to the city and providing a better, um, more functional um, sports and recreation amenities. Thank you.
Julia, on the on the youth ball field complex. So if I'm reading this right, so I mean, with the amount of money, well, the the, the idea is seven fields. Is that what I'm, or or is that that's is that right. what you're five, five to seven fields? We probably need about oh. 15, 20 acres. Okay. Um, we've got some configurations, you know, that we'd like to see. Um, parking is a big deal. Uh, if you know we put in 600 parking spots at the sportsplex, it's got a capacity of 1,200 people for that indoor facility. And I think everybody's aware that when you have people playing, coming, and going at that facility, we, we, they're, they're lining the streets out of the sportsplex. Oh, yeah. Um, so very similar, but an outdoor facility. You can imagine you've seen Shawnee uh, Sports Complex on tournament days. We max out the parking there. How many parking spaces we have down there? Um, it's it's right about, I think, at 500, 450, right. 500. Right. And that's on the – on the on the baseball side of the creek, correct? Right, right. Okay. I and mean, whenever you're talking, go allude a little bit on the, I mean, obviously sports field lighting, but then it says potentially artificial turf on, I mean, you, that could be, be a possibility on a few of those maybe? Well, I have been thinking about that and as popular as Kapaha has been, um, mm -hmm. I think it would behoove us to put in an ad alternate for um, artificial turf on one or two of those. We have really seen an increase in usage at Kapaha because of that artificial turf. A lot less maintenance cost. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and, and you can, in the spring, I mean, you're getting, you're able to use it more. Yeah, right. less wear and tear on the fields. It's a big, I mean, it's, it is a big capital replacement cost, so you have to keep that in mind. It's a pretty big chunk every time you have to redo parts of those fields, but they typically have, you know, eight to 10 year lifespan. My only concern on, my my only concern, and I've told Scott this and the mayor, is, is that, you know, 15 to 20 acres of land in Cape Girardeau can get very expensive very quick. So, you know, and, and I think that's partially why we, I think of at least me, wanted to at least discuss with the Cape Public Schools on, on that partnership. Um, $50,000 an acre for 20 acres and you've ate, ate a bunch of your budget, you know. And so I think that's why, you know, I, I, I wanna make sure, I know we're talking RFP, but I still wanna make sure that we're including Cape Public Schools in, in, in some potential partnership there. Yes, and we're, you know, we're aware of their property. It's not in the necessarily the best location. I know it's not access. ideal for your, your clover. I, I get that. I understand that. I just, I, I, my, my idea is, is saving, saving as much money right. as possible. Do you know how much acreage is there uh, at that site? They have about 40 acres. Blanchard. Mm -hmm. okay, not good. all. Not all of it's usable. It's. I think it's got some elevation challenges as well. But it's it does. I looked at that, and you know, I think Simo's got. I thought, yeah, and this is we're just talking, right? So I looked, and you know, I think Simo's got a their practice softball fields there, and mm -hmm. you know, I, I you start getting too many organiz or too many groups, and it could be difficult. But I thought, you know, what if we what if there was some potential there too? You know, that's another, I, I don't know. I mean, it, 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 I like it intrigued that. me that there was a softball field already there and what you could do there, you know, I don't know. Well, you're, not, you're not off base. I like that property. I've been through there. It's beautiful. It would actually make beautiful park property or some type of amenities. You've got Sloan Creek that runs through um, part of that section. Um, it's it's some really really nice property for something. How much property is uh, the property in front of the sportsplex? Mm. 
I want to say it's close to 20, maybe. Is it 20? Okay. And the other site in South Cape is 43 acres, I think. Yeah, that's um, and the, the other section that we're looking at that has that frontage parcel off of Kings Highway, but then I think it also has some other different owner attached long ways that heads down right. towards uh, Shawnee. All right. Pretty low. It's all, of course, pretty low, but. Well, the good, the good thing about the RFP process is, I mean, it, it, an RFP can say, here's, here's the land and here's how much it costs. It doesn't mean that you have, they have to develop, you know, everything about it, you know, but you, it allows you to evaluate every possibility and how much they're looking at, you know, kind of establishing a price for at least the land. And then the development of it can be that, but, but by, by having competition where people are bringing you that, we, we know of three, maybe there's three more. I remember when we did the, um, when they did indoor sports, um, there was a kind of a, uh, an idea of an existing building conversion that, you know, everybody kind of thought, well, that's the best, that, that, that will be the one. And, uh, but actually when it came time to do the presentation and really look at the value of all the different uh, proposals, a different uh, one emerged. So uh, I like the idea of having uh, competition and certainly doesn't exclude uh, the school from being part of that competition. Um, so here's, just a, here's just a quick question. So does the city, so if, if we're talking about Blanchard, I personally love the idea of Blanchard because it's in Ward 1, there's flat arable property there, but there's a chunk of land between the fire station and Blanchard. It, that's owned by the city, right? There, that's, um, I want to say Choctaw, is it Choctaw? There's a, it's an undeveloped piece of property that has, also has some elevation okay. uh, challenges, but um, it is city property. Okay. Yeah, all of that, all of those woods around there uh, to the back or to the, to the north and south, um, I'm looking at it right now on text parcel viewer. Um, yeah, but I think, I think there's 47 point, sorry, that's a different organization. There's 7.32 acres and then there's some other company, Kelso Development owns the acreage. So there's not, there's not a lot there, but yeah. I, I, I like, I, my, my sole purpose was uh, partnership and cutting the cost for land down and, and, um, if you cut and, the cost of the land, it gives you a lot more capability to have the amenities you want uh, and do it first class. And, and at the end of the day, we were looking, we're looking to replace arena. I mean, that's, you know, and I, I, I mean, that's, we're talking youth. If we were talking, if we were talking, in my opinion, if we were talking uh, a travel complex and we want, and we were talking about, South, having something like South Haven, then then I would probably lean more for something different. But we're talking about replacing youth ball fields. Well, well, we are we are Robbie. We that was part of it is that in order to try to help offset some of the um, expenses, it's not just community use. It would definitely be to attract tournaments to our area because that age group is just so big with bringing in parents and grandparents and uh, we're again we're that regional draw and it just would make sense for us to um, capitalize on that that type of a complex from an economic impact standpoint. No I understand I just I, I'm and I don't know how we worded it but I I'm, remember it being hey this was to replace youth ball fields. Well it was there was a dual purpose there and that and that's important because they're there's a lot of money to be made in hosting tournaments, not just the economic impact, but if uh, I could see in the future with a new facility like this and the your Shawnee complex, uh, the city could almost uh, just have a person on staff just year round to do tournaments mm -hmm. and, and pay for that person and more. Yep. Julie, uh, a quick question just for compare out of comparison's sake. How many fields are at the current Shawnee? I know they're bigger fields, but. Um, both, you mean just uh, ball field? Like yeah, the ball field, baseball softball, field. Baseball, goodness gracious, we've got seven. Seven baseball. 
Yeah. Kevin, and about approximately how many acres is that facility, including the parking? If you, in um, just the baseball portion or also yeah. the soccer and? No, not the soccer, just the baseball. And you may um, not know, I just don't know if you're a fan. Probably say about, um, I mean, the whole facility is 120 acres. Um, so the ball field portion again would probably be maybe close to 30, okay. 35, 40, including parking and. Yeah. I know this is going to be off the ball field topic, but I just have to ask because I get asked about it every single day. Um, Red Star Park. We had a really successful uh, catfish tournament down there, and you saw these massive boats that are incredibly expensive boats. People were on the river, enjoying the river, and um, it's definitely, you know, talk about an economic development opportunity to, to have that river tourism or catfish tournament tourism. Uh, just a unique opportunity uh, to be Riverside. Right. You're right. That you're coming up, Dan. Um, yeah. Red Star is in the queue. That's probably one of the next ones that we're going to be looking at. <laughs> I, still think, I still think some kind of an RV park there uh, would be. Well, and I think it needs to have a conversation between the Department of Conservation, the Parks Department, and the casino to really see how we can best utilize that space in order to boost tourism in general, park usage, casino usage. Because it's every night I drive past that casino and there's a two hundred thousand dollar RV. Casino was interested in in helping with some kind of a RV facility there, so that's that's still a possibility. Yeah, so I think it just has to be a facilitated conversation, just to to make sure everybody, you know, we utilize that space as best as possible. It's still there. They're just waiting for yeah, the money had, to come in. Yeah, we had some pits and starts with that. Um, you know when when uh, we'd had some pretty productive conversations when before they changed ownership and then the ownership kind of put everything on stop. And so now then the ownership's kind of getting their feet on the ground. I think it's a good time for to start having those discussions again, Dan. Yeah, I agree. COVID thing didn't help either. Yeah. But you know, the good thing is that COVID doesn't, doesn't matter whenever you're out on the cat on the river fishing for catfish or you're in an RV. Oh. Yeah, uh, because I, I can't remember the number of boats they had, but it was really quite the quite the deal down there. They had you know food trucks, and it was just a neat thing to see in Cape Girardeau. Yeah, they had over fifty boats, I believe. Yeah, and I think they pulled in over two thousand pounds of catfish. Mm -hmm. That acreage, uh, and I sidebar the the uh, neighborhood watch program in in the Red Star area is top notch because I love driving down there and, and looking at the river and I'll go down there and eat lunch and look at that area. I love that area right there. And of course, Dan texted me and said, Hey, I, neighborhood watch said you were down at, uh, down in my neck of the woods. <laughs> yeah. I, I really like that I area. Got name on your license plate. Well, yeah, that's true too. Um, but <laughs> I'll tell you that area and I still slip and call it honkers. <laughs> Uh, but that area there, I, I think we have so much potential piggybacking on what the mayor and, mm -hmm. and Dan and Joe, like that area right there, we could be so much and so big. And, and Dan and I have talked about it offline about, you know, what we could do that you see bigger communities uh, with a, maybe a potentially for a marina someday and, and hosting some, you know, these people that, and these bigger boats that are traveling up and down the river and, and they, you know, I, I think there's just a huge potential in that area right there. And um, I think talk about economic driver. I mean, I think that's something that an economic driver and tourism and I, I, I really like that area right there. Mm -hmm. It's just very special. We've got a unique opportunity right on the Mississippi River to do something very cool. And uh, from my vantage point, you see these massive, incredibly expensive boats going up and down the river almost all year long. And, and that's, that's not even just river boats, trap, you know, riverboat cruises. Those are people that buy gas and supplies and all kinds of stuff. Those are 30 and 40 foot boats that, you know, uh, go up and down. They're going to Kentucky Lake. They're going down to, to, the, to the Gulf, I mean, which you can do from there. So... 
I think I think it would be neat. I think that's obviously part of a long term piece, but man, it's just great opportunity. Yeah, we really do have a cool opportunity there. Thank you, everyone. Please, um, if there's any other questions, please don't hesitate to reach out you know, to Scott or I. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you, you Julia. Yeah. Um, our next uh, discussion is about the violent crime strategy. Um, several months ago, um, I started working on a, um, a one stop or one page uh, um, list of things we are doing to try to, to uh, deal with violent crime in our community. Because um, a lot of times, you know, when something happens, we'll hear uh, the city's got to do something. We've got to do something. And um, I think we probably have not done a good job of saying a lot of things are being done. Um, and so that started out a, um, this idea of a safe Cape strategy. Uh, we worked together with a lot of our partners to come up with a, um, uh, uh, this uh, one page, uh, I don't know if you got it, but it, uh, we sent it out to you. It looks like that. Um, uh, so hopefully you've uh, printed it out. But we um, have those, and i um, not going to sit here and read them all to you, but certainly on the left side of that page, uh, those are responses. Those are, those are things we have to do every day to, to respond to violent crime and to try to prevent uh, or try to uh, take care of the day-to-day -day of violent crime, all the way to the right side of the page where we're really talking about trying to get at the root cause of violent crime and, and generational poverty and, and all of that. So um, I would like to have uh, uh, Wes talk a little bit about the things that they're doing and some of their stats. And then uh, I've also asked Julian to come on board and, and talk a little bit about porch and and uh, Julian's on vacation, and so I asked him to come on board. So I'm going to let him go first, Wes, uh, uh, a little change in, uh, in order uh, so that he can get back to his vacation. Thanks, Julian, for, uh, for your time. And just give us an update on, uh, on porch and, uh, and progress that you've made in this COVID area, era. Hey, thanks, Scott. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so with... Uh, with Porch, we've been doing a lot of what we've been doing on the crime side has been a lot of research uh, and just trying to figure out exactly, you know, what the issues are in Cape and how we can help to uh, to bridge that gap. And I think it's I mean, there's a lot of different moving parts with it, obviously, as there is with uh, the criminal justice system. But whenever we look at the statistics, um, I know. we're Oh, lost him. Work on the. Uh, the economic impact of the community and figure out how we can get those people to a place to where they don't feel. Like mm. We're not out stealing and those people just don't feel like they have enough and don't feel like they're cared about there. So I think that's a, that's going to be a huge part of it. And then also trying to get other resources into that community, um, you know, mental health services, focusing on getting something for the kids to do. Hey, Julian. Um, I think you're cutting out. Uh, uh, I, I think maybe your bandwidth isn't we'll enough increase. to do the video and audio. Maybe if you cut your video, you won't cut out on us. Am I better now? Let's try it. All right. Is that better? Yes. yes. All right. Perfect. Um, so, yeah, I think there is a, like, a, I don't really know what you guys heard. Um, so I'll kind of start it over. But I think that a lot of the crimes that we see are thefts, and we're trying to figure out how to boost the economy in South Cape and get those people to a place to where they don't feel like they have to, um, you know, partake in those crimes and those types of issues. And also, I think a lot of it is trying to figure out how to get more resources down into that area as far as mental health services, um, counseling, and figuring out how to get kids something to do. So I don't think it's, you know, specifically a crime strategy. It's a neighborhood, you know, revitalization strategy, which is what we're working on as Porch. Uh, part of what we've found in our research is that whenever we look across statistics, and I know that some of these are, there are instances where, you know, it has to happen. But whenever we look at the statistics, there's uh, 50 or, I think it's 58,000 calls to the police and then 8,000 
of those isn't one of those like defund the police conversations but if we you know reallocate some resources and have try to figure out how to get some volunteers in place to maybe go out to some of those calls that aren't violent and don't result in crime uh you know maybe there's some places that are already doing this uh eugene oregon oregon specifically has a group called cahoots where they send out social workers and they split their 911 calls into you know this group might be able to be handled by social workers and this group definitely needs to be handled by police so if we can figure out something some kind of strategy like that to uh you know get the community more involved in policing themselves basically because a lot of what people think is that they're over policed and under protected so if we can you know if we can divert some of those resources to you know figuring out how to get more into south cape then i think that would help with a lot of the crime um and then on the back end of that you know i think that's more of what uh chief blair and you know the prosecutor's office would be able to speak to as to you know enforcement and what that would look like uh julian can you talk a little bit about um your efforts with um with the uh, purpose built and uh, some of the connections you've built with other communities and with Kathleen and the and the movement toward uh, becoming a uh, affiliated city. I know they've kind of got a um, they kind of got a uh, hold on making people affiliated, but I know you've done some work uh, moving in that direction. Yeah, and that's um, part of that. I think the biggest piece that they've been worried about is that housing piece. Um, and whether we'll be able to you know make those proper connections and we have been able to work on that low-income housing piece but purpose built they're basically looking for us to show that we're moving towards uh, their model and part of that is you know decreasing the crime rate uh, raising the property values in south cape getting more home ownership into the hands of the residents and without gentrifying those areas developing a mixed income housing uh, mixed income housing program without you know kicking the people out that are already living there basically so we are moving closer towards that and the community or the purpose built conversations that I've had have been very productive. They're very excited about what we've got going on. Uh, I think that once we, uh, once we get a little further on that housing piece, they'll be a lot happier with us, but you know, they're excited about the pool issue. Um, you know, they don't, they only see that a pool is being put in, in our targeted area. You know, they don't see the back side of things. So I think that a lot of the perceptions that we were thinking that purpose built had, they might not be, um, might not have those same concerns that we thought they had initially. So, uh, so yeah, no, they're very excited with what we've got going on. I just think that we need to, uh, to get more, more moving as far as the housing piece. And then uh, the crime is also going to be a big part of what we're, uh, we're trying to accomplish. So. Very Julian, good. On the housing, on the housing piece, is there, and you talk about gentrification and so do you see, do you, do you all see that um, some new, but then also, and I don't want to put words in mouth, but new new construction plus some renovation? Is that kind of as far as? Well, yeah, it's purpose built. Um, it's all about you know beautif beautifying the community and also attracting those new residents. So um, I definitely you know we have beautiful homes down there in South Cape that need work, and we have. Uh, some places that people are renting that are, you know, not up to standard, not what we want them to be. So figuring out how to, uh, you know, get the properties that are already there uh, up to speed for the residents themselves. And a lot of that's landlord issues. You know, we've got a lot of curb in the house where that, uh, that, those pipes have you know crashed or are getting backed up so it's a landlord issue that uh, i think that we need to figure out how to get these landlords to get their properties uh kind of up to speed and i know me and scott had talked about that you know how they have their uh, minimum standards or whatever it is so um i just think it's you know getting pro some of those properties out of the hands of the landlords that don't care about the people that are living there and also getting new housing in for people that are in apartments now that you know want to own a home and opposed to if they're just renting a piece of property that doesn't look great. I mean, there's people that are paying almost what I pay in mortgage for a property that I would not want to live in. So 
I think that that's a huge part of it. Do you think that there's room for, you know, for when you're talking about that, I mean, do you think the group would welcome, you know, some development from, you know, some nicer, newer apartment complex or townhomes? And, and so, so you could have, you know, some of that mix. Do you think that would, the community would be behind some, some development like that? Yeah, I think as long as it's done properly and we're not just throwing up cheap houses that, you know, people aren't wanting to, uh, to take advantage of. But that's what we're looking into now is putting up, you know, 30 low income houses there um, to kind of offset that middle, you know, the middle to fair value homes that we would need to put in as well. Because we have to have both of those strategies as far as purpose built. They want low income housing and they also want fair value housing. Okay. Um, so we've been talking with uh, some developers in the area to possibly put in 30 homes that they would do the uh, low income tax credits on. And okay. then after 10 years, they would have to basically, uh, we have to do educational uh, programs with those residents to teach them about home ownership, mortgages, uh, you know, credit repair, that kind of thing. And then at the end of that 10 years, they would be able to buy that property at a very discounted rate, um, like 40% of, uh, of, the of the actual value that it was appraised at initially. So, uh, so yeah, we've been talking to Chad Hartle about that and looking into some possibilities of uh, low-income housing. And uh, again, we're opening up to some other uh, other possibilities to do that as well. Not just uh, not just locked in with the idea of uh, using Chad, but you know, trying to get shop around and see see what we can do to best uh, yeah. help our organization and the South Side. Have you gotten I, any traction with existing landlords, uh, them inspiring them to clean up their properties or, you know, make them decent places to live? Well, the thing is, I mean, I went and met with the landlord association and only one of them had properties in South. Did that Scott them? gave us, uh, the map that Scott gave us, it's, we got a map that said, you know, who owns, how many landlords own four or more properties? And we thought it was going to be like, you know, four or five landlords. And it was like 32 different landlords that own that many properties down there. And I think a lot of them are not local. Uh, so some, some of those properties down there, people don't even know that they're, you know, run down because they haven't come in to check on them. So I think that's part of what we got to do is figure out who those landlords are and how to connect with them. Because like I said, I went to the landlord association meeting thinking I was going to be able to get the ear of the people who need to rehab their properties and none of them were there. So, yeah. cause what is it? Cape Girardeau has 700 plus landlords. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And so we've got a lot of people cause even in, in the red star neighborhood in ward one, there's a lot of non-resident landlords that really could care less. As long as they're getting their monthly rent check, they could care less what their property looks like. Yeah. And unless well, we can inspire those people to sell properties or we can inspire those residents to buy those properties, it's really going to be a tough road because as long as those folks are getting their check, they don't care. Yeah. And that's where I think if we get new housing opportunities, then those people start losing their checks. And if you can hurt their pocketbooks, then that's when they start to care Yeah, uh, as far as those people are concerned. So I think that's part of it. And also um, there's a law that we've actually uh, been talking with a few people that use this. And there's a law where a nonprofit organization can take over abandoned properties. And as long as we have a plan to rehab them and those, uh, Home or those uh, property owners can buy it back from us, but they have to then complete that rehabilitation. So, or pay us for the rehab that we do. And it's a way to basically beautify the neighborhood without, uh, and take the property away from those landlords that are just letting them be run down. So, uh, so that's another thing that we would want to look into is how can we get some grants to, you know, take advantage of that program and, you know, help a local contractor. If there's a contractor in the South side, you know, Jeremiah Dukes or Wiki or somebody like that, they could come in and help us rehab these homes. They could almost build their whole business on, you know, hiring people from the South side to rehab the homes that we're able to take, uh, take ownership of. So I think there's a lot of different opportunities there for housing. Um, it's just going to take a lot of work, a lot of support from the city and uh, some funding. Uh, another piece of that is we, we also have tenants that, either are reluctant or scared to report their their place that isn't meeting the minimum property standard to us. And so and we don't have that that complaint in order to then go to the landlord and say, you have a certain amount of time to fix this, then then they're like you say, as long as they're getting their check, they just keep going. 
So yeah. that's another thing that we need to build that and an understanding among tenants that, you know, if you're, if, if your if your sewage doesn't drain, that is a problem and, and we can make the, the landlord uh, meet that standard. Yeah. And I think it's all education because when somebody's sewer doesn't drain in their basement floods, I mean, I've, heard several times that it's a city issue and the city doesn't take care of their, you know, sewage system and that kind of stuff. So I think it's an education of, you know, telling, letting the property owners know that they have the right to complain without worrying about losing their house and being, you know, kicked, having their lease terminated. Because I was say, do you ever feel as though the, the renters feel like they can't, you know, contact anybody because of, of losing their lease? I mean, I think that's a huge fear. I mean, we see, issues now where people can't even find a new place um just yamika robinson specifically has been you know searching for places and can't find one so i could see a situation like that where she would be scared of losing her lease but if she said something because you know where else are you going to move to yeah um so yeah i think that is a huge fear and like i said i think education is the first part to give them that empowerment to be able to say hey things aren't right and let's figure out how to fix them um, so I'm hoping to, you know, have community conversations where we can actually have people show up and, um, you know, a lot of the stuff that we've done so far, it tends to be a lot of the, you know, greater Cape community want to help, but I, we need to have conversations with the actual people in the community and get that information out there. Thank you, Julian. Yeah, man our housing piece you know that's our our thoughts as far as you know trying to figure out how to get the low-income housing middle-income housing attract new tenants while also helping the tenants that are already there you know get their property up to those minimum standards that we uh we require yeah, yeah and i think working together we can we can do that and um and yeah that people don't have to lose their lease and and they can get it fixed you know so definitely now we've been doing a lot of back-end stuff and uh now that we're getting our committees ready i think we're going to see a lot more a lot more movement great Julie, uh, that, thank you. yeah go ahead that go ahead, nonprofit go ahead. acquisition piece i mean that could be potentially huge or game changer what uh has that been successfully done um in missouri yes kansas city uh there's an organization over there that's using it and basically it has to be uh, abandoned for six months behind on property taxes and some sort of nuisance. Um, so, you know, if we can find a property like that, it's the basis of the rule is that it's obvious that if the taxes are in default and it's been abandoned, that those people don't. Just bring in the city. When I initially saw it, I was like, there's no way this is, you know, constitutional or right. But uh, looking into it a little more, it was, uh, yeah, it's being used successfully. Cool. Yeah, kudos to you to, for finding those opportunities out like that. Well, it's definitely going to take a combination of all those things to make the housing thing work and to do it right. And uh, they're off to a good start. So thanks, Julian. Appreciate yeah, you thank you. On, on your vacation. Thank yeah, you. you. Yeah. You can go ahead and uh, get back to your vacation, Julian. Thank you okay, so much. Okay, all right. I'm going right. to get back to the beach here. <laughs> all right. So, you guys have a great day. everybody hi and, uh, and enjoy. Sure will. Thank you very much. Uh, Wes, you want to catch us up on uh, kind of some of the uh, things you're doing within the strategy as well as your uh, mid-year uh, report on violent crime statistics? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk to you folks today. Uh, I won't read through everything that's on the sheet that you've got. You, you've seen it. a lot of the things that you know about that we're already doing as uh, far as trying to engage with our community, um, make it more comfortable for people to want to talk to the police about crime uh, when it occurs. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, that's kind of what it all boils down to is in order for us to, to solve crime or stop crime, we've got to have uh, community engagement. So that's what we spend a lot of our time trying to focus on. Um, but in addition to that, uh, you can see that uh, we do some some targeted patrols. Uh, we still do our street crimes task force that we do in conjunction with Highway Patrol and surrounding agencies. Um, and if you'll recall, a couple of council meetings ago, uh, where uh, Pastor Green spoke about doing um, what uh, she called hotspot policing. That's the targeted patrols that we do. It kind of fit into what that theory is. Um, 
that's one of those things that uh, you have to kind of tread carefully on because you can do too much of that to one extreme, then you're targeting uh, a community, a, a disadvantaged community by doing it. So uh, that's something, a needle that we try to, to thread and be sure that we do it while we're still in, 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 or in putting into practice uh, procedural justice and treating people fairly and accurately and not just targeting everybody that's walking down the street like you know, you've seen in, in larger cities like New York with their stop and frisk and all that. So, so those are some measures that we do try to take. Um, one of the things that uh, we've really put an emphasis on is working with our federal partners, especially on gun crimes and felons with guns. Um, we, you know, if you, we can get somebody into to federal court on a, on a gun charge as opposed to a state court on a gun charge, there's a lot more uh, chance that they're going to spend more time in prison and out of the community. And those are the people that we really want out of our community are the ones who are committing the violent crime. Um, so we, we've seen some success with that um, and have had you know, great conversations with both our state prosecutor and our, our federal local federal prosecutors who are all on board on, on working through that system together. And uh, there's not any big egos in the room, which is, is a nice thing to see. That's something that you don't always see in a lot of communities where the, you know, the federal prosecutors and the state prosecutors sometimes are at odds or the federal agencies and the local police are at odds. And that's not something that we experience here. We work really, really well together. And so um, I think, you know, going forward, we can see some, some real benefits of getting those people into that federal system. Um, again, you can see, you know, violent crime is not just necessarily a police problem. It's, it's a societal problem. You know, we, we usually get the call after it's happened, um, but you know, we're not in the schools uh, doing the education. We're not the social services that are giving people opportunities that uh, better their lives. But it's important that we have a seat at the table when, when talking with those agencies too. And so we're always welcoming those opportunities to work with people like Porch and different social services in the schools to see how we can come alongside them and uh, help with education and reducing the violence in our community. Um, on the violence piece, you, you saw that I, I gave you our first half of the year statistics on uh, violent crimes. And, you know, surprisingly, you know, across the nation, we're seeing this year is a extremely violent year where some cities are reporting their violent crime, their shootings are up by 40, 50 percent in some, some instances. Um, for the first half of the year, we were actually down one shots fired call. Now our victims have increased, but the number of shootings have not. So you know more people have been shot, but uh, there have not been more incidences of shootings within our community. Uh, and when you look at the gunshot reports, that's that's a pretty high number. We put in every time that we were called for a gunshot, uh, every call that we responded to. So not all of those generated in us finding something. Sometimes they were, you know, we we got a couple of calls where we got out there and there was nothing there, no shell casings or anything like that. Uh, but just to be totally transparent, we included those numbers uh, in our total calls for, for gunshot reports. Um, you see our homicides are, uh, well, until last week, our homicides were, were down for the year. Now we're, we're even with where we were last year with, with three. Um, so while no crime is, violent crime is a good thing, um, yeah, I am a little encouraged to see that we're not, we don't seem to be following the national trend this year that a lot of the other cities seem to be experiencing. Uh, of course, the year's not over, and sometimes CAPE is a little behind in catching up with the, the national uh, trends on everything. Um, but you know, we, we've readjusted some of our staffing to have more officers out during peak times and things like that. So we hope that that'll mitigate that and kind of keep that down. So um, with that, I welcome any questions that any of you might have. Here's just a, a quick question. Why does it feel like it's worse than it was? Because it seems like every time I turn around, I'm hearing, hearing about gunshots or I'm seeing a video on, on uh, that somebody took of an intersection where somebody did something. I mean, why does it just feel like the numbers, it, it just feels to me and from the sense that I get from the community that the numbers should be going up. But then I look at these reports and they're stagnant, you know, to, to where they were last year. Yeah, you know, yeah, I was going to say, a lot of that has to do with social media, with the, with more people having cameras on their phones, and they're taking video of everything, and they're posting it to TikTok or Facebook or or whatever, and, uh, and honestly, just more uh, attention to it uh, in, in the media as well. Um, you know, because it's a national thing, of course, our local media is going to want to cover what is trending nationally as well, so when we have gunshots, 
I recall seeing a couple of reports not so long ago, um, news reports where they said police responded to gunshots, didn't find anything. So um, that's not something that's new to our community that is happening. I think it's just getting more coverage than what it has in the past. Chief, Anything? can you speak to the, the, I know that they're uh, supporters and, and they're not supporters of the governor's violent crime bill. Can you speak to the benefits you, you see or will hopefully see in our community? Yeah, I think, you know, some of the enhancements for uh, some of the gun crimes are going to be really beneficial to us. And one of the problems that we've experienced um, here locally is juveniles carrying firearms that we just can't do anything about. Um, and they're carrying them for felons because the felons don't want to get hit with the, the felon in possession of a firearm. And they know that there's some loopholes in our state statutes now that allow the juveniles to carry the guns and there's no real, no real repercussion for that. Um, I think that's going to be a big benefit if the legislator decides to, to act on that and pass that. Um, I know that the governor has talked about some legislation around protecting victims. Um, as y'all know, our, our biggest issue is getting victims to talk to us. Uh, so depending on what that legislation looks like, that could be very beneficial to us. I know one piece that they talked about was that, you know, victims' statements could be entered into uh, testimony and the victims didn't actually have to appear. Um, I, I would be cautious to put too much stock into that. Um, I'm not an attorney, but that seems to me like a, a Sixth Amendment violation of the right to face your accusers. So I don't know how much traction that'll get, um, but I, I would think that prosecutors are going to be pretty reluctant to want to be the first ones to try that case in front of the United States Supreme Court, and I don't blame them really for that. So, but I, you know, I think at least since it's getting the state attention and the governor's attention, I, I think there are some positives that can come from that. Um, but you know, we'll just kind of have to take a wait and see approach to what the legislators do in this session. Also, one last piece and, and I've heard um, this is sounds like a Hail Mary in certain aspect but are, are, do you ever are there any communities out there that that try to do their own witness protection so to speak I just feel it goes back to what you were talking about but I'm just kind of curious not not that I am aware of or that I've had conversations about I, you know I'm sure some of your larger cities might be able to do something like that in, in a city the size of Kate, because a lot of times witness protection is a relocation um, of the witness, which is why the federal government can do it so easily. They've got a big, huge country to relocate people to. Most of your communities don't have that. Maybe some of the larger uh, cities do, but that's not something I've heard coming from cities on, on the same size as ours. Have we ever thought about ways to protect our witnesses locally? Um, that, that's a really broad question. So I'm not trying to know. the answer on that. Um, but yeah, there have been instances where honestly we've taken up money between detectives and bought somebody a bus ticket and sent them out of town. Um, the, you know, the, the key to that then is getting them back in town to, <laughs> to testify for court, um, which is, which is an issue. So yeah, it's, there's, there's pros and cons of, of doing that, but you've got to be able to get them back here to, to testify as well. Okay. I've just had some residents and in, in conversations with people about, you know, you know, going back to what you said, getting people that are willing to come forward and, and what, what we're doing to ensure their safety and what can we do to get more people to come forward. Because we're, Lord knows it's not just going to be, you know, you can't, you can't, you guys can't do it all. I mean, I, I do understand that. Right. And, you know, the unfortunate thing is outside of relocation, placing an armed guard out inside somebody's house is about the only way that you can really, really protect them. Um, and we certainly don't have resources to, to do that. So. Okay. Chief, one of the things that's come out of the, the defund the police movement is to uh, provide more funding to the police departments. Uh, in the avenue of mental health professionals and those versed in other societal issues that that are that are facing us now do you foresee maybe there'll be future grants to do things like that 
Yeah, you know, I hope so. Um, if y'all will recall a few years ago when we went for the use tax, that was one of the, the things that we wanted to fund with that was um, mental health professionals that worked within the police department to address some of those issues. Right. Um, and that's, you know, so many of our calls that we go on are mental health related. Um, and so having somebody in house to help us address those issues would be huge. Um, now that there's, you know, the national push for that, I, I think maybe we might see DOJ or some of the other agencies out there that have funding maybe do that. Um, right now, I think the, the, um, the chatter that you hear now is just taking it totally away from the police. Um, I'm not sure that that's the safest thing. I'm not sure that you're going to find a whole lot of healthcare workers are going to want to go to a house where a guy is swinging a knife at his family members because he's got a mental health issue and not have police respond with them. So, um, I, I don't know that that's the right answer, but embedding those health professionals within police departments, I, I do think is the right answer. And hopefully we will see some funding for that. Hope so. And I hope we, uh, you know, we, you know, I've, I've said this before and if, uh, if we're in a good situation in Cape Girardeau, uh, right now on, on having tax issues before the public, but if, and if, if uh, our legislature does not do something with this use or internet tax, we're going to be forced to. And as part of that community effort, uh, public safety has got to be a big part of it if we do it. Uh, uh, Chief, I, I, uh, I know uh, crisis intervention officers, I know you've trained a tremendous uh, percentage of your officers in crisis intervention with mental health. And, and while that doesn't make them a mental health professional, I do know that we that you've taken quite a bit of effort to try to give your officers tools to at least recognize uh, mental health issues. Right. Yeah. So I think the last statistic I looked at, I think it's like 97% of our patrol officers yeah. now have crisis intervention training, which is a 40 hour training. So it certainly doesn't make them a healthcare professional or a mental health professional, uh, but it gives them the tools to recognize that. Um, you know, we, we really strive to be at the forefront of that in the crisis intervention and law enforcement. Our assistant chief, Rodney Barker, sits on the state board for crisis intervention. Um, and so, you know, he's always getting good, valuable information from that and networking with other, even other states on how they're doing things. Um, and has really ramped up our program and done a great job to kind of keep us at the forefront of that. Well, and if we had that mental health professional within police that we could then uh, when our officers recognize it, and you know, maybe it's not an arrest situation or something, they could refer them and then they could have the follow up um, that, you know, even the, the mental health uh, agencies that are out there, they don't have the time to, to get to what they, you know, some of these things that maybe if we intervene now it would really help. So I, it, I, I want to recognize the, far, the fact that you are at the front, forefront and we want to continue to be there. Um, right, and, and I want to recognize community counseling too. They've been great partners with us on this, um, you know, and one of their counselors is in here several days a week and uh, looking at reports, you know, we'll report to them, hey, we've dealt with this person, this person, and this person, and he'll go out and do follow-ups. Our officers will go out with them sometimes to do follow-ups. Um, so, you know, we would, we would be really stuck if it wasn't for the partnership that we had with community counseling, but even they can only do so much because they're limited in resources too. Uh, can I ask a uh, unrelated question, or I don't want to. I don't want to stop any of this conversation. Uh, I've had somebody reach out and ask me about how to start a neighborhood watch, Chief Blair, and is that something the police department is involved in? Or um... absolutely, uh, you know what we would we would love to see a lot more neighborhood watches in our community, and that's it's been such an uphill battle for us here since since I got here, and I, I don't think it's exclusive to here. It's um, so many people just don't know their neighbors anymore and they don't interact with their neighbors. You know, my, my neighborhood that I live in has a Facebook group that's kind of a neighborhood watch. It's not a formalized thing. Um, right. But if somebody wants to start at an actual formal uh, neighborhood watch, um, have them contact uh, Corporal Couch. Um, that's part of what he does is helps facilitate that. And uh, we would love to participate in those. Great. Okay. Chief, this is another just sort of off topic uh, question. Have you uh, have you been hearing a lot more citizen concerns about homelessness? Um, we have heard some concerns about homelessness. Yeah, I, I don't know that it's been a lot more. 
Um, but you know, we did, we have heard, you know, people concerned about, well, if people are sleeping on sidewalks or they're in the parks or whatever. Um, and that's just such a difficult topic to, to address because, you know, they have the right to be on public property just like anybody else does. Um, but, uh, you know, our officers are pretty good at trying to find them the resources when we encounter them. If they, if they want to get into a facility, you know, we've worked with Pastor Green, we've worked with Salvation Army to, to into the Amen Center also to get them uh, into housing if they need housing. But um, yeah, I think that's something that we're seeing a lot more just, and it's more of a transient population than people who are really from Cape Girardeau as people passing through. Somebody's got to have a hard question for me. So far, these have all been pretty easy. <laughs> I got a question for you, actually. There you um, go. I knew you, I knew you would have the hard one. <laughs> save the best for last. Um, I, I do have one question. Does our department actually have a victim advocate or someone that fills that role that whether they're sworn or not sworn? Just, just throw that out there first. Right, so the department does not. We, we utilize the prosecutor's office victim advocate. Um, that, you know, that's something that would be a benefit probably to have, but that, you know, that's the requirement of having, adding another staff member. And we found that, you know, working through the prosecutor's office and their victim advocate has, has been helpful. Um, and then also on the domestic violence side, you know, we work with the safe house on that a lot and their victim advocates on the domestic violence end of it. Um, kind of fill that role for us as well. And uh, as board president for the safe house, I can twist arms on that too, if I, if I were to have to, but they've always been really good to engage with us on that as well. But your department would benefit from having probably a sworn officer be in that role that could actually respond to a violent crime. Yeah, I think that we probably could. And that, that's actually a really good point. I do think that we could probably benefit from that, saying that in-house we did have a victim advocate and didn't rely on another agency to do that for us. And I can tell you from my own experience um, in a major city working with law enforcement that they actually had four officers that were victim advocates and they provided victim bill of rights and they actually stuck with the victims and the families from start to finish, from the beginning of the incident to the end of the case. And I think that would actually help members of our community a great deal if we could establish at least one or two positions in our department. And, and what Councilwoman Truxell is referring to is it's somebody that is within either the police department or in this case, what we use now is the, the prosecutor's office, that that person is the resource for a victim of a crime from the time that the report is taken throughout the entire court case. Um, and so there is, there is some benefit to having that one person that can be that go-to person for somebody because the criminal justice system really is um, difficult to, to navigate through. It's difficult for me as a professional sometimes to navigate through and figure out who am I supposed to talk to or how do I find out this resource or whatever. Um, so that, that is really a good point. I, I do think that there could be some benefit uh, in us researching maybe having our own victim's advocate that even could coordinate with the other agencies. Other questions? A couple of things I want to point out um, before we leave this subject. Um, uh, if you would kind of look at the, at the uh, handout that we have and and let us know any kind of wording or, or concerns you have about it. We that's not a, this is not yet a public document, but at some point we think we, it, there's some value in having something for folks to refer to that looks at whole, this holistically. Uh, currently, like I said, it's an internal document, and uh, so I'd like your input. Um, you know, throughout the next week or so, about how you feel about this becoming a, a public document and something you can refer to. Um, we um, also on here is Senate Bill 572 impacts, and it just points out that that, that bill is really makes it difficult for us to um, to get compliance on a lot of these things. You know, it's the old uh, adage that if you'll take care of the nuisance items and, and those type of items that it really uh, combats crime as a whole, and if you've got kind of a whole that, that, that affects violent crime, well, when you can't get started with these things, it, it's it's a difficult thing where you can't bring people in with nuisances. They're not, you know, you can't collect from them. You can't, you know, 
punish them in any way. It's, it, it really has been a problem. So we did have that on there. don't know whether, you know, people are comfortable with that being on there. And then the other thing just want to talk a, a couple of minutes about is the Anti-Sexual Violence Task Force. So the, uh, the County Department of Health has a grant uh, from uh, the Missouri Department of Health to basically look at a uh, community health assessment and then develop strategies to make the health of the, our county better. Uh, one of the things, uh, and, and some of that data and, and process of that uh, is on the back, uh, where they look at uh, what are those risk factors, what are, you know, what are things we can, can be done. Um, what we would like to do is, is really plug in and be a part of this. Uh, it's domestic violence, but we, we, yeah, I've actually talked to uh, Commissioner uh, Herbst yesterday about really making that more about all violent crime uh, within our county. And most of the violent crime in our county is happening in our city. So we want to be involved in that task force and be a part of looking at and finding the root causes of those things and then looking at, at strategies to address it. And we think that, uh, that working with the county hand in hand uh, may really be a, a great opportunity for us to, to take advantage of that. So I wanted you to know we're, we're um, and, and uh, Commissioner Herbst was, was good with that, excited about that and, and strengthening our relationship. One of the things of COVID, it is, it's beginning to, I think, strengthen our relationship with the county again. And, um, and so this is another opportunity for us to do that and going forward uh, to have them working hand in hand with us on, on violent crime. So uh, we'll be plugging into that and we'll keep you informed. Um, Scott, can, can I add something on the Senate Bill 572 thing also? Thank you, um, yes. Uh, just kind of put that in context for what that means in Cape Girardeau. Um, before the passage of some of these this state legislation, we were running a population in our jail on ordinance violations of you know, 14 to 15 prisoners per day. Um, I think our daily average now on um, prisoners on ordinance violations that our local or municipal judge is sentenced to is around three. Um, so, you know, a lot of the teeth has been taken out of court on being able to sentence people for uh, not complying with the, the laws of, of Cape Girardeau. It makes a huge difference, and it's something we've got to continue to lobby for this next year. Well, and then if you think about it in the context of, of financial impact to the city, whether I've got three prisoners or, or 20, I still got to employ the same number of jailers. Um, so you're spending a lot more money to uh, house three prisoners uh, than what it would cost per prisoner if you're doing you know, 14 or 15. Of course, to mitigate that, as you know, we've started taking in federal prisoners and are getting some, some financial assistance from the federal government for that so, um, to try to balance that out. But uh, just, you know, for the context of what it was before Senate bills and now afterwards, that's kind of what we're looking at. Thank you for that data. That's, uh, that's a really strong uh, uh, example of what, what those impacts are because, you know, ultimately we don't want you know, we don't want to put people in jail. We just want compliance. And when you get compliance in those areas, then that leads to less crime, which leads to less violent crime. And that's, that's what we want is compliance. We don't care. Uh, we don't care about the fines. We don't care about the jail time. We just want to buy, and we're not getting compliance. That's, 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 the, that's, the, that's the bad part about it. It'd be nice if we were down to three and we were getting compliance, but we're not. Probably have less compliance. Exactly. That's the bigger picture issue of what the consequences are is you end up with situations like North Henderson, where there's a known chronic offender that you can't do anything about. And that's really. Yes. But that's where I see a lot of those issues come from are exactly like that, is that there's chronic, we have, we have chronic difficulties that, that culminate with a whole bunch of issues in a small area or with a singular landlord or with a singular, you know, property owner. And, and those types of things eat away at public confidence in how we can respond to these things. Um, and, and so I'm looking forward to seeing how this violence uh, task force would, or crime and violence task force on the, the county level would be able to, you know, potentially give us some insight into how to fix these types of issues. Because I've always been a proponent for a crime and violence or a crime and poverty task force. And I just want us to find solutions to some of these issues so issues like North Henderson don't continue to erode the public confidence in what we're able to offer. 
Yeah, and if you think of it, and if you think of that in, in context, what, what we used to be able to do is when when we first started had the violation, we brought them in, we find them. If they didn't if they didn't uh, respond to that, then we brought them, we jailed them. Well, now then you have to have, you know, it's chronic. We we have to get to the chronic nuisance, go through that road. Well, that's you either have to have some horrible thing happen, or you have to accumulate enough to be to become defined as a chronic nuisance. So so we're waiting until it's horrible. The neighborhood's just screaming. I mean, it's not because they're screaming, it's because you have to, to, to have enough to then qualify under the chronic nuisance uh, ordinance. And so, you know, it's, it's the old thing. Good. If you do it early, prevention works. And then it, it's just really frustrating when you have to wait until you have that, that, uh, that accumulation. Does the council have any latitude to change what is considered a chronic nuisance in the city? We actually... Uh, updated it once already but that's really about as far as what we think the constitution allow us to do i mean we're we're now to where certain things even one occurrence of certain things we can we can do but you also uh, but then other things you have to have more we think we're about as tight as uh, as aggressive as we uh, dare be because there's already movements out there that are to to get rid of the ability to have chronic nuisance Great question. Yeah, I just want to make sure that those those issues don't happen because just what Julian Watkins was saying, you know, we we've got to figure out these systemic neighborhood problems that that erode public confidence, and we've got to make sure that people feel comfortable in their homes. And 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 there's just this general there's a general consensus that something needs to be done. Well, hopefully this um, this sheet will give you at least some ability to say. We are doing some things, and uh, hopefully this uh, this uh, committee will allow us to uh, look holistically at, uh, at at this and and bring some maybe some additional resources to bear uh, through the county. And so um, get it, and uh, we'll we'll work forward. Any other items? Uh, I know we've gone long. We're uh, this morning, uh, but appreciate all of the interaction. That was. It was very good. I think everybody has interacted at one point or another, and uh, thank you for that. Um, Mayor, do you have anything else before uh, we uh, adjourn and then uh, come back at two o'clock? I don't have anything else. Yeah, one, yeah, one thing. Yeah, we talked about uh, our relationship with the county, and uh, uh, Dwayne Hawes and I have uh, are making an effort to meet with Clint on a more regular basis and just have conversations about issues uh, or just to stay in touch. So if there is anything that, that you're aware of that, that uh, comes up that we need to talk to with the county, just let me know. Okay. Good. Other than that, well, uh, thanks chief. And uh, thank Julia. Uh, for all your presentations and your information, and I thank Julian, but he can hear me. But uh, right. anyway, uh, we'll see you all this afternoon at two o'clock. Well, thanks to Nicolette for putting together a lot of that, uh, a lot of this information. And I can't I forget Nicolette because she puts everything together. She just sits there behind the scenes and does everything. And Take on it. That's true. That's true. <laughs> thank you. Very gracious. Thanks, Nicolette. Thanks, Nicolette. See you guys at two. Thanks, guys. See you all too. All right. Thank you. Get to.